Okay, this is video 18, and this is going to be our one video on the Krito. Um, and my big focus in it is just going to be on the central argument of it. We're going to structure everything around that. Although it is a, an important, not it's not just an argument, right? It is a story um, and a demonstration of Socrates' values and of the value of philosophy and of the state. Um, so we'll just start by reviewing the story, right? Um, the idea is that Socrates has been sentenced to death. We saw that in the previous dialogue, um, but the death sentence cannot be carried out until the end of a religious uh, uh, pure ceremony, when a, a ceremonial boat comes back from um, someplace. And uh, so during that time, uh, Socrates' friend Crito assembles enough money to bribe the guards and smuggle Socrates out of Athens um, and into a safe life um, and somewhere else. And Socrates says, no, no. In fact, I am duty bound to obey the will of the state um, when they sentenced me to death. Um, so the big thing, is, the big argument is just Socrates' central argument to Crito. Now, I had you do an argument finding exercise prior to this, um, and you may have come up with any number of other arguments. Um, Crito's arguments, for instance, for why Socrates uh, should go with him are, uh, ju are just as a reasonable an answer to that question. Um, and there's some interesting things that can be said about them, right? Um, so among other things, Crito gives a weirdly selfish argument um, for saying that Socrates should, es should escape from prison, um, which is something like, if you, if you don't escape from prison, it's going to look bad for me. People will say I was a bad friend. Um, I've got a theory about this. Um, my pet theory is that this is double reverse psychology. Um, that is, uh, Crito knows that appealing to Socrates' self-interest won't work. Socrates isn't interested in preserving his own life, but he might be interested in preserving um, the, the reputation of his friends. So he is, uh, he, he's giving a selfish argument, but only because um, <clears throat> he knows that Socrates will only be moved by altruistic reasons, right? Um, so he's got to explain why this is important for someone else besides Socrates, and in this case, that's him. All right. Um, in any case, the central argument uh, begins like this. And I've got a slide here about the nature of argument in general. Uh, let's just review this anyway. Remember, the way we deal with it, arguments are composed of statements. A statement is an assertion. It is a bit of language that you say is true or is false. Um, and it doesn't have to be one or the other. You don't have to know which one it is. It just has to be the kind of thing where you could, it would make sense to say that it's true or false. And so the contrast here is things like questions or commands or just sentence fragments. Um, and the important thing here is that statements can be either normative or descriptive. They can either be about the way the world is or the way the world should be. Um, and in this sense, the idea of a statement or an assertion cuts across another distinction that you probably uh, had to learn in high school, which is the difference between facts and opinions. Um, and for us, that doesn't make a difference. They're all just statements, um, some of which can provide evidence for others. In any case, when you connect st statements together uh, so that some of them provide evidence for others, you have an argument. So let's look at the argument here. <clears throat> Socrates' argument begins actually at this incredibly general level. He just starts by saying, 
one must never do injustice. And, you know, at this point, Crito says, yes, Socrates, because a significant amount of these dialogues just consists of um, Socratic interlocutors saying, yes, Socrates, and it gets really tedious. Of course, um, the, you know, the Confucian dialogues mostly consist of the um, Confucian interlocutors asking a question, being quiet, and then asking someone else to explain Confucius's meaning. At least that's a common pattern. It's probably, it's not really as common as the yes Socrates pattern, but still. Okay, Socrates begins with this incredibly broad statement that you kind of have to agree with. One must never do injustice. Right, of course. I mean, that's, that's, injustice is defined as something you shouldn't do. Therefore, you shouldn't do what you shouldn't do. Therefore, one must not return injustice for injustice. Oh, already from what seemed like a self-evident premise, we have derived an intermediate conclusion. So I'm using the dotted lines here to represent in, in, an intermediate conclusion. And statement two um, is a conclusion for statement one and a premise for what comes after it's statements three and four. Um, so, or just statement three. But in any case, um, we have this intermediate conclusion that's actually already kind of radical. In fact, Socrates specifically says, most people won't believe this. It's also interesting, um, if you were raised in a Christian tradition, in the Christian tradition, this, this has a lot of resonance for you. It's going to sound like um, turning the other cheek, um, right? Uh, it, n not doing, not harming, loving your enemies, the Sermon on the Mount, that sort of thing. Um, and it's interesting to see whether Socrates means the same thing by um, not returning injustice for injustice that, um, that Jesus does. All right. Once we get this idea that you can't return injustice for injustice, we get another conclusion. You must never break a contract, even if the other party has wronged you. It's that second intermediate conclusion. Um, every citizen has a contract with the laws of the city to obey those laws. Um, and I'm actually mushing two statements together here, but that's okay. Um, the duty is even stronger than the duty to parents. So he's now introducing what uh, will become extremely popular later on in European philosophy, something called social contract theory. This is the idea that society is based on a contract. And this should come naturally to uh, people who were raised in America because the founders of this nation uh, were all steeped heavily in social contract theory. And the whole role of the Constitution in uh, our government is based on a heavy idea about social contract theory. This is an early version of social contract theory. Um, and it's a little weird, and I'll talk about that more when we go into detail about each of these premises. In any case, um, one must obey the laws of the city. This is the final conclusion, even if the city has wronged you. Um, and then you just apply that to Socrates' situation, and you realize that um, uh, he is obligated to stay and accept the punishment that was handed down to him. All right, I want to make a distinction between two kinds of arguments that's important here. A priori and empirical. So this is a matter of epistemology. Remember, epistemology is the study of knowledge, what it is and how to get it. Um, and there are many different theories of how to get knowledge. The dominant theory of how to get knowledge in Western society today is a variety of empiricism. So that says that um, our knowledge is empirical. It comes in some way or another from the senses. 
And this has a lot to do with the rise of the empirical sciences in uh, the Renaissance and early modern period and the success they had in generating technology. Um, a related theory of knowledge actually is the one that I ascribe to Confucius. I label Confucius's theory uh, pragmatism. So it's not quite uh, the same as empiricism. It doesn't specifically tie knowledge to the senses, but it does say that the test of knowledge is doing, right? Um, you must in some way, uh, if you know, you, if you know it, you can do it. So both the empiricism and um, Confucian pragmatism contrast with a, the style of knowing that Plato promotes and that Socrates is using in this argument. And we're going to call this a priori reasoning. Um, it literally just means prior. Um, prior to what? Prior to the senses. Um, the idea is, and this is something I, I talked about in the uh, video where I talked about the origin of uh, Plato's thinking. One of, his, one of the roots of his thinking is in this guy Heraclitus. Heraclitus said, the world is constantly changing. You cannot step into the same river twice. Anything you know about the world of the senses will change. So you, you don't really have knowledge about it. And Plato accepted that. He accepted that knowledge, that the senses couldn't bring knowledge. Um, seeing isn't believing. Your eyes deceive you all the time. Um, instead, Knowledge has to come from something prior to the senses. And so later, the later Latin tradition called this the a priori. But it's just the stuff that's prior to experience. Um, and on one level, we know that things in some way, somehow, there has to be some stuff prior to experience because you have to already have some cognitive ability in order to process things to begin with and to have experience. In modern psychology, this comes out um, with uh, uh, a strong belief that certain propensities to acquire knowledge are innate. In earlier um, forms of epistemology, it just kind of, it comes out with the idea of a priori knowledge. So wait, what does this have to do with the crito? Let's go back a step. One must never do injustice. This is a good candidate for what you might call an a priori truth, because it seems like it's just true by definition. Injustice is something you shouldn't do, therefore you shouldn't do injustice. Um, and I, I can phrase it more precisely, um, uh, in a way that makes it absolutely clear that it's true by definition. I could say, injustice is defined as something you should never do, therefore you should never do injustice. Um, but it just seems to be part of the definition of the idea of injustice that somehow you don't do it. That's wrong. That's, what, that, that, that's the wrong thing to do. Um, so, if it's true by definition, it's common to say, uh, that it, you don't need to know anything about the physical world to know it's true. Um, and people who've had other philosophy courses will notice that I'm blurring together a bunch of different ideas here. And uh, this is an intro level course, so that's just going to happen. But we're going to say an a priori truth is, uh, includes tr statements that are true by definition. For instance, uh, the standard example is all bachelors are unmarried men, right? Um, you actually don't, there's no empirical investigation into the world that you could engage in that would pr show that all bachelors are unmarried men is true or false. Um, it's just true by definition. If you see some guy um, and he looks like a bachelor, he lives alone, he eats ramen noodle soup, um, but 
he's actually married, then he's not a bachelor. Right. And that so, in fact, rather than it being something you learn from experience, uh, the, this kind of truth by definition seems to be something you bring to your experience prior to it in order to understand it. Um, and like I said earlier, in modern psychology, this often gets cashed out in the idea that you are born with certain innate capacities in your mind. For Plato, this meant actually um, knowledge, all knowledge was in your soul from a prior life. We'll talk about this when we get to the Phaedo. So what's going on here is an a priori argument from a really broad premise that seems to be true by definition, all the way down to a specific premise, a specific conclusion about what Socrates should do in the here and now. So it's got this kind of V-shaped structure. Um, and this is a style of argumentation that Plato strongly favored. Um, and it was dominant in European philosophy, although not exclusively so, up until uh, the scientific revolution when empirical styles of argument became more popular. All right. Let's take a look at some of these premises. So one thing is about premise one. Um, it sounds good. It sounds like it's, it's um, uh, true by definition, but is it even really? I mean, has anyone gone through life without doing injustice? Seems like actually you don't. Yeah. Well, you could say, you know, the less injustice you do, the better. The perfect life would be one that in which you do no injustice. Um, and all of that seems like it could be a defense of this claim. But it still doesn't seem to com work with all the complexities of life. For starters, Socrates seems to equate injustice with harming people. So does he mean that you shouldn't harm anyone ever? Well, now actually the relationship back to uh, Jesus of Nazareth becomes important. The Sermon on the Mount and the discussion of not um, of turning the other cheek is often interpreted as a call for pacifism. Many religious traditions in Christianity have actually taken this very seriously and, you know, um, refuse so that followers will refuse military service. If, if that, that might be what Jesus meant, but is it what Socrates meant? Well, no, actually it's not. Because we know, we know that Socrates was a soldier. Socrates fought against the Spartans in the Peloponnesian War, and he fought bravely. Um... So the deal with warfare in ancient Greece is it was mostly done by foot soldiers called hoplites, and they formed a phalanx. That means they um, put their shields next to each other to create a wall, and then they had their spears coming out from in front of the shields, uh, right? And it, so unity was incredibly important for the Greek phalanx because if one person broke the wall, then they're all dead. We know that Socrates had no problem with fighting in a war and fighting bravely. He did it well. So state on state violence, not a problem. State on individual violence is going on right now. Law enforcement, Socrates seems to embrace that. Individual on state, like terrorism, um, individual on individual, ordinary fighting, well, does premise one rule out any of these categories of violence? Hmm. Well, actually, I think well, a lot of it depends on what you mean by harm. Um, and so I've got this as a discussion question. Hopefully you worked through this on your uh, own um, in the discussion board. Um, 
I want to suggest one thing can, can help us make sense of Socrates' claim here, um, that you should never do injustice and that injustice is harm. Because remember what he said in uh, Apology. Real injustice, real harm, is making someone unjust. He says, you can't hurt me by, hurt me by killing me, that's not real harm. Harm is moving you away from justice. Harm is corrupting your soul. So actually violence is fine as long as you don't corrupt people's souls. That's, that's my read on that. All right. Well, should you ever return an injustice for an injustice? Hmm. Well, if we really want to say that injustice is just, that harming people is just making them unjust, it may even be that the state hasn't harmed Socrates, and so that's not even the case here. Or maybe making someone unjust is one form of harm, but, you know, just a, a, a badly run trial is also another form of injustice. Hmm. Well, in any case, it really looks like uh, this is going to, no matter, even if you read it as allowing for violence, it's going to require some major rethinking of how people typically live their lives. Um, and one of the things that comes out in some of Plato's other dialogues is that um, justice turn, turns out to be much more of an inward manner than an outward inward matter than an outward matter. Justice is having your soul in order. Um, and things that happen on the outside, like being exiled or jailed or executed, don't make a difference for that. So maybe this just means tend to your soul no matter what. I don't know. It could mean a lot of things. The one thing that we know for sure it means is that Socrates has to accept this punishment. One must always obey a contract, even if the other party has wronged you. Again, this looks like it follows from what came previously just by definition. It follows a priori. We don't even need to investigate the world empirically to know this is true. If you can't return a wrong for a wrong, you can't break a contract for a wrong. Well, actually, this is the part of the argument that I'm most suspicious of. Oh, no. Second most suspicious of. Um, actually, as we, as we go down these premises, I get more and more suspicious of them. But I'm definitely suspicious of this one, because at least in um, Western modern contract law, if someone breaks their side of the contract, you aren't obligated to keep yours, right? Um, so... Uh, Greek contract law was different. I know, I know that it was different. I, I don't know enough about Greek law to know how. Um, and so maybe this might seem a plausible thing for uh, Socrates to say to his audience. But I certainly, you certainly won't convince me if, you know, I pay you to, if I say I'm going to pay you to paint my house and you don't paint my house, you're not going to be able to come to me and say, Oh, well, you can't return an injustice for an injustice, so you still owe me money. Not going to buy that. Well, another thing that, uh, well, actually, let's, uh, in order to understand why this might be plausible, let's look at this next premise. Every citizen has a contract with the state to obey the laws of the state. Um... There are a lot of things that make Socrates' version of the social contract different than modern versions. But one really important thing is that Socrates specifies actually that the state only has like two duties to the individual, um, to sanctify their marriage and to give them a chance to argue their peace in court. And so this gets to the um, uh, 
repeated phrase from the dialogue, persuade or obey. So yeah, this actually, this next slide has what I was looking for. Um, Socrates says that the job of the state is to sanctify marriage and educate children. Um, and then later on, he says that he, you know, they, they will give you a chance to argue your case in court. So the other two items on this list, uh, the three items, are all things that don't count as the state's side of the bargain, according to this. For instance, enforce laws equally amongst all citizens. That looks like the thing that the state violated here, right? Um, that is, the state is targeting Socrates um, unfairly, even though plenty of other people do the same thing that he does, um, because he is viewed as sort of a unique threat to, to stability. And remember the social context here. Um, Athens just lost the war with Sparta, um, and they narrowly escaped genocide. That is, standard operating procedure would have been for the Spartans to kill all the men and sell the women and children into slavery, and they didn't. So things are tense. Troublemakers aren't welcome. Um, still, if you wanted to say that the state side of the bargain involves enforcing all laws equally, uh, then it might seem that signaling, that signaling out Socrates breaks their side of the bargain. But um, that's not what Socrates thinks. And he certainly doesn't even think that the state is obligated to pass reasonable laws or just laws. In fact, all they're obligated to do is listen to your arguments when um, you say, uh, when, when you disagree with the laws that are passed. Another odd thing about this um, is that the contract is with the laws and not with other citizens, right? Um, modern social contract theory specifically envisions the laws as being created when the citizens sign a contract with each other. So the preamble to the Constitution begins, we the people, right? Um, uh, we the people are coming together with this Constitution in order to form a more, and then they have the reasons that, that they're doing it, in order to form a more perfect union. Um, and if you're my age at this point, you're actually, you hear the Schoolhouse Rock song in your head, um, establish justice and pure domestic tranquility, he, he. Provide for the common defense. Okay. Um, modern social contract theory, the law is created by the contract. Here, the contract is actually with the laws. So that's strange. Um, <clears throat> and the state is actually said to only be, is actually genuinely responsible for the individual's existence. If the state didn't exist, if Athens didn't exist, Socrates wouldn't exist. This actually gets back to a, a, a point that I made earlier, and I, it, it's worth reiterating. Both Plato and Confucius are authoritarians. They do not believe in any real democracy. Um, and they both respond to the problem of the dictator, not by trying to keep any one individual from having too much power, but by developing a theory of education that would ensure that, the, that your rulers are just people. So they both have theories of moral education, and honestly, that's why I like them. Um, it's not because I'm an authoritarian, it's because I, I, I understand their theory of education. So this is a strange thing. All right, I have a couple more discussion questions here, and these are just things that ordinarily I would do for a live classroom, but I'll just talk about them here. So one, one question that seems, um, that actually I find really weird is, why is the Crito all about obedience when 
apology is all about disobedience. Remember, an apology, Socrates said again and again, if you order me not to do philosophy, I am going to disobey you. You cannot stop me from doing philosophy. Um, I have a higher duty. I have a duty to God. Um, and this is, this is the rebellious Socrates that gets name-checked, for instance, by Martin Luther King in a letter from a Birmingham jail, right? But now we turn around and we say, oh, actually, all that stuff about disobedience? No, actually, you have to obey. That seems weird and contradictory. So normally I just ask students if um, the Socrates is contradicting himself. Um, and I get a few good answers on um, why he's not. And so I, th I believe the bullet points here are literally just left over from my last in-class, in-person discussion pre-COVID. So one standard answer is, hey, look, Socrates in Apology was talking about duties to God or the gods. And that trumps duties to the city, right? Um, also, death isn't a big deal. Quitting philosophy is. In general, right, people like this move that Socrates did. People will often say things like, if Socrates um, had listened to Crito and escaped from prison, he would have undone all of his teaching. He would, um, he would have just betrayed everything he ever said. So there's some sense of pride or honor here, um, being true to your philosophy, being true to your word. The other thing is that continuing to philosophize is just, right? Whereas um, escaping prison is unjust, according to Socrates' strange ideas about justice and injustice. Um, I also, I should say that Socrates belongs to a weird philosophical tradition. He may even be the start of this in the in the West, where um, killing people is perfectly just, but like not respecting them as rational agents or you know not being willing to reason with them is unjust. Uh, that always troubled me. But you have to read more Western philosophy before you get a sense of how weird this trend is in, in the European tradition. In any case, Socrates wins Crito over um, and he uh, refuses to escape from prison. Um, and actually this does have the exact effect that people thought it would. It shows that Socrates is a man of his word and as a result, Socrates becomes the martyr, the hero of philosophy in the European tradition for the next 2,000 years, right? Um, 2,399 years, plus 21, yeah. Um, but in any case, um, uh, it is, uh, he is the hero, right? Um, so... There seemed to be some movement in Socrates' beliefs between Apology and Crito. The last dialogue that we're going to look at, and we're only going to look at the deathbed scene of it, um, is called Phaedo. Um, and this is, in fact, the end of Socrates' life. Socrates, this is the scene where Socrates is put to death, and he has one last philosophical conversation with his friends. And we're only looking at the actual death scene in it. Um, so Phaedo and Republic uh, are both middle period dialogues. So uh, we read one tiny bit of Republic. We read the allegory of the cave. Um, and now we're going to read one tiny bit of Phaedo, the death scene. And um, these are both little snippets of middle period Plato, which is more complicated um, uh, more uh, more advanced than the early Plato that we've been reading, like with Euthyphro, Apology, and Crito. Um, and uh, I want to talk about it because we're getting more of, as I said, with 
the cave, we're getting more of Plato's own ideas here. And we, uh, that is ideas that are separate from what Socrates taught. Um, and the ideas are, are more sophisticated and weirder. Um, but in any case, uh, there's a further shift from apology, right? You move a little bit from apology when he uh, changes his emphasis from disobedience to obedience. Um, also in apology, though, he said, well, I don't know what happens after death. Maybe it's a long sleep or maybe there's an afterlife. Either way, um, it's not a harm. In Phaedo, as we shall see, um, he is emphatic that there is an afterlife or that the soul is immortal. It's going to be the most precise way of putting it. So take a look at that. And I've got one exercise around that. Um, uh, just two simple questions. What is a soul and why should I think I have one? Um, and this is important because as we'll see in the next video, the whole idea of an immortal soul is something that is on the rise in Greek thinking. Um, and it's not... The, the idea that you have an immortal soul is not obvious. Um, some cultures believe it. Some cultures don't. Here's an interesting moment where you see a culture in transition from a no-soul, uh, so this-world-oriented society to a soul, next-world-oriented society. So, uh, I, most important thing, spend some time thinking about what is a soul and why should I think I have one and answer that exercise.